we, we all probably know it and are probably sick to death of it, but we'll just review it anyway. Um, and then we'll look at the, the effect of Brexit on different areas of strategy for your business, uh, followed by, by a summary. But uh, first of all, if I may, just a little bit about Go Exporting. Uh, we're a specialist export consultancy that um, successfully launches business, uh, businesses into new international markets. We're passionate about export and we have a global network of uh, consultants where we can help um, enter any market or uh, do any kind of research that you need. Uh, everything from export readiness through to assessing opportunities, strategy and opening new markets. And we've made Brexit a major part of our business for the last couple of years, making sure we're up to date and that we can um, pass on the implications to our, to our clients through Brexit reviews, through answering their questions and, and consultancy and so on. So without further ado, though, we'll get on with today's topic. <clears throat> so the current situation, we'll look at where are we now, what's going to be changing, and of course, then what are the implications um, and then other challenges that we have in the world today, which, as we know, are, are quite there's quite a few. So the UK officially left the EU on the 31st of January this year. So we're no longer an EU member state, but we're in this transition period until the 31st of December this year. And the government announced in June that uh, that won't be extended. And I think all the noises that we're hearing, uh, even with the COVID situation, that that won't be happening. <coughs> Excuse me. So until the end of this year, we remain in the single market and the customs union. Um, and we're seeking to enter into a comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU. But what is the deadline for that? I mean, at one point it was said that 15th of October was the deadline. That came and went. Michel Barnier then said the end of October. And now we're in the middle of November and still we're talking and it looks like it may be extended again. Uh, so the there's a history of deadlines being extended time and again with negotiations with the EU. And we could well see a 12th hour agreement, um, hopefully before the, the deadline and giving it enough time to be ratified by the relevant governments. The final round of discussions is now in progress and there is some hope that there's some progress but that there are a couple of key issues that um, are causing stumbling blocks one is fisheries and the other is subsidies um, and the, the potential there is a potential solution on fisheries where it's reported but um, that's by no means certain and the french in particular are not happy with the with the proposed solution it's such a small part of the overall trading between the EU and the UK that um, it shouldn't make a difference, but it is a politically hot topic. So it is being one of those areas that's been focused on. And the other area is, is government support, government support for, um, for businesses and for artificial support that gives unfair competition. Um, that's another area that um, there's disagreement on at the moment. The EU wants the UK to follow EU rules moving forward and in terms of maintaining standards on environment and labour and so on, that um, we want to be able to do our own thing, basically. So we're looking to the other area of um, the change is that we'll no longer be um, part of the EU's free trade agreements with other countries. So, for example, it has a free trade agreements with Japan, with South Korea, Canada, and so on. So we, we will need to renegotiate all of our free trade agreements. We've started, and there are some. There was an announcement last week about the um, UK-Japan agreement, but there's still some way to go in, in an agreement with Canada, for example. So there's, uh, there's a lot of um, areas that need improving. And we've also now got in the last week all this turmoil at number 10, from sackings of chief advisors through to the prime minister now self-isolating again. So um, it, there's a lot of things that, that uh, can go wrong at the moment. But deal or no deal, there will be changes. There'll be profound changes in the way that we um, act, interact with the EU. But what is changing? So we're no longer part of the customs union or the single market. We, we effectively become a third party country to the EU, which means the end of free movement of goods um, and, and labor, the end of free movement of labor. 
But what about um, the service sector? Uh, that also will be affected, although it's not quite so, so clear at the moment. Um, we still need to, to see what the changes are there are going to be. Um, so free movement of labor has implications for your um, strategy, which we'll see a little bit later. And as far as the service sector is concerned, I mean, that's the biggest part of our economy. 80% of national output and an even higher percentage of jobs is in the service sector. 50% of our exports are also in the service sector and 40% of service exports are to the EU. So it could be a, a major impact if things are not sorted out in the free trade agreement. So Brexit does threaten potentially a heavy blow on services, uh, possibly harder than manufacturing even, although there's been very little attention to that so far. Much depends on what the terms of the free trade agreement, if there is one, will be. But in reality, most free trade agreements hardly touch the topic of services. So the biggest um, challenge is to get mutual recognition of quali qualification, standards, assessments, and so on, so that services can prov be provided in both areas. So uh, as we've already said, the UK loses access to EU free trade agreements, so we're trying to negotiate our own, and will no longer be governed by EU law. We want to, the UK wants to move away from that completely, uh, but we may have to accept some parts of EU law in order to get a free trade agreement. Uh, and we want to become this independent sovereign state that we hear so much in the free world so that we can have our, our own influence. But we have to question what is our real position and power in the world these days. Um, we, we always talk about the US special relationship, but that may be affected, of course, by um, the, the potential election of, of Biden and uh, because of his support for the Northern Ireland Good Friday Agreement, um, which may affect the Northern Ireland Protocol and so on. But unless there's a free trade agreement, we'll be falling back onto WTO rules. And there the duties could be quite high. So animal duties, these are averages 16.3%, dairy 37.5%, manufacturing 2.2% and fisheries 116 so it's a you know there, there could be a potentially a big effect if we don't get a free trade agreement with the EU. What are the implications of all of that? Well, we looked at this in detail in a previous webinar, but just to to mention, you know, the starting point is the HS code. Um, that's the code that you need to. We will you you will give you the details of of your duty rates that that will apply to your products and any any licenses any um, procedures that apply to your products or services, uh, products, sorry. You also need an EORI number. So if you're exporting from the UK, um, you need a UK EORI number. That's the um, Economic Operators Registration Identification. Um, if, if you're actually selling into the EU, uh, in some instances, the way, in the way you do that will mean that you'll need also an EU EORI number. And if you're dealing in, from Northern Ireland, you will need an XI um, EORI number. So there are different areas there that need to be looked at. Customs declarations is obviously another big area. Um, there'll be, they reckon there's gonna be an increase of 300 million customs declarations, um, which is going to be a major challenge for the economy. You may now need sanitary and phytosanitary certificates for your animal or plant products that are being exported. Uh, and there is maybe just some changes on strategic controls and, and licenses that you need to take into account and you need to check if your products are still covered or if they're newly covered by uh, UK regulations. Rules of origin is another area. Can your product qualify as UK origin rather than EU origin, depending on the inputs that, are, that go into the product? Uh, VAT changes also. So, you know, now import VAT will be due at the point of importation into, into the EU uh, and into the UK, although the UK is allowing that VAT to be put back onto your um, VAT return. Approvals and CE marking, we're introducing our own UK CA certification, which the EU says they won't recognise. So it could be that we'll end up in a situation where you need to have UK CA and CE marking to supply a product into both markets. Uh, INCO terms is <clears throat> one of the big areas. You need to get the INCO terms right because that will govern 
what taxes and duties and VAT you're liable for or your customer or supplier is liable for. So that's an area that does need to be looked at. And who is the importer, the importer of record? Um, you will no longer be the importer into, into the EU. Who your customer will be or your distributor will be, and that brings some challenges for them as well. And there are changes to e-commerce um, in terms of VAT and in terms of um, the e-commerce directive no longer applying. But what about other challenges? You know, Brexit is not the only challenge facing businesses at the moment. There are constant changes which affect strategy. Um, surprise election results push back against immigration, for example. It's an uncertain world that we live in. Of course, we have the, the COVID-19 global pandemic. We've had recessions. And another area of change is accelerated technological change. There's been exponential growth of global data and digital technologies, which has changed many businesses forever and will continue to do so. There's environmental concerns and racial, political and economic inequalities. So we've seen it with public awareness of the environment, dissatisfaction with the inequalities. For example, the Black Lives Matter movement, Marcus Rashford's campaign on school meals and so on. This has led to a growing importance for businesses of their corporate social responsibility as a fundamental of their uh, business strategy. And it's something that needs to be to be you know, taken into account. This has led to the concept of always on change, which has been coined by the Boston Consulting Group. So it's no longer enough to change strategy to resolve one issue, for example, Brexit, and think that that's the job done. You need to have a constant eye on the world around us and review the effect on our strategy. You need to be agile and fast reacting. So hence this always on change philosophy within a business. So what is the effect though of Brexit on strategy? That's the purpose of this webinar, is to look specifically at the effects of Brexit. But I did think it was important to point out that this must always be part of the wider consideration of always on change. So we're gonna have a look at how it affects your core business strategy. And then the specific areas that we will need to review strategy in. So for example, your global footprint, supply chain, labor, uh, competition, innovation, value proposition, which may be, we may not immediately think of as a strategic choice, currency, marketing communications, and finally, leadership and relations. So we'll, we'll look at each one of these in a, a little bit more detail. So what is your core, looking at the core business strategy? So I always ask clients, well, do you have a business plan? Do you have a written business plan? When did you last review your business plan? And you'd be amazed how many have not looked at it for five years, 10 years. Some don't have one and they don't remember where it is and they've not really reviewed it yeah, anytime soon. So do you even have a written plan? And really, when was the last time you dusted it off? And now would be a good time to review it, to look at it and see if it really still applies in the new normal, in the world that we're living in today. You know, have you amended your strategy um, over the last few years? Because there's been a lot of change anyway, so um, you should really have done. So fast changing world necessitates an ability to act quickly to that change. How agile is your business? Um, it's important to include team members in strategy discussions. Do you, do you do that? Get different opinions and different perspectives. Brexit is a prime example. There will be people within your organisations that have completely different perspectives on, on the Brexit and, and the Leave vote in the first place. Was part of your strategy to con concentrate efforts on the EU, for example, uh, due to the ease of doing business there with the single market and, and the customs union? Well, perhaps that's not no longer valid uh, or needs, certainly needs to be reviewed um, if it still makes sense in the current situation post-Brexit. The milestones that you had in your business plan, assuming you, you had one and you, you built them in, um, are they still valid? In your original plan, you set these milestones that you intended to hit along the way, along your business journey with, with timescales. Um, it's time to review them and see where you are versus that plan. Has reality and the plan diverged? And if so, what does that mean for your business? 
Are the original milestones still valid in the post-Brexit world? For example, one milestone that many companies have had is to, to have a distributor covering every European EU country by a particular date. Well, has that changed now? Do you need maybe a master distributor um, due to the EU importer record requirements, for example? Or should the EU be your complete focus altogether? So again, so you need to review these milestones and see if they're still correct um, for your focus in the, in the coming years. Same with KPIs, the key performance uh, indicators. Will, will Brexit affect them? Have you taken into account possible loss of EU trade, the dip in trade? Have you considered the UK market may grow actually as supplies from the EU become less competitive or there's unreliable supply from, from EU um, suppliers? It may help your, your UK market. You reflect on what those changes may mean for your business and for your profitability. There will be changes. Um, so do you need to adjust your focus or the way you operate to take these changes into account? And do you need to amend your, your KPIs accordingly? Um, you may have had a KPI for European sales. Do you need to increase, you know, have a KPI now for international sales, other international sales, um, for the increase in your UK market KPIs and so on? So these are key areas that, uh, that need to, to look at. And on a more fundamental level, is it time to review what your company actually does? When was the last time you considered if what your company does is exactly what the market is looking for? And will Brexit bring about a change in the market? For example, will demand for made in the UK grow or will it decline in, in your markets that you're, that you're working in? Um, and looking at innovation, um, are there opportunities to get ahead of the competition whilst they're busy looking to survive Brexit? You know, look at, looking at um, all of these areas, is um, how are you going to um, put forward your products and services? Do you meet a localization agenda in, in your target markets? It may be that say, you know, the French decide they want to buy more French goods uh, or the uh, UK wants to buy more UK goods. So you need to take those point, those, these things into consideration and what your actual co company really does uh, with, these, with your products and services and are they um, correct for the new normal. Also the way you operate. Uh, that may need to be reviewed and your strategy may need to be, to be looked at. Is all your production in the UK, for example? Um, are you too reliant on that? Would you ban benefit from establishing some kind of production in, in the EU or some kind of facility in the EU? Um, where is your supply chain located? Um, if that's all in the EU, will that cause issues? Um, do you have alternatives? So. Again, look at the way your company is operating in light of the new change. So really what we're saying is press pause, plan for the practical implications of Brexit for sure, keep those going for customs declarations, VAT charges, uh, VAT changes, and they must all carry on full steam ahead. After all, there's only 44 days to go. But amid that mayhem, take a breath and a moment to consider your core business strategy. Now may be the time for a reset. We, we advise clients to look at scenario planning. So develop a course of action that will be robust under many different scenarios. Consider the big picture effects of Brexit and think through how different elements of your business could be affected. And then follow through the different scenarios to their logical conclusion, however unlikely that may seem. So you get different scenarios. The unlikely does happen. The leave vote is one. No one really thought we would vote to leave. And no one really thought that uh, Donald Trump would get elected. So the unlikely does happen. So follow through the scenarios and have planning for different scenarios and pick a, a strategy which can deal with all those different elements. So one area that uh, definitely needs to, to be looked at in terms of strategy is rethinking your global footprint. There are 135,000 UK businesses have only sold into the EU, never sold elsewhere. Are you one of those? 
Uh, it's been easy up to now, hasn't it, to uh, to sell into the EU because all the countries are the same. But now everywhere will be the same, whether it's USA or France or Ireland. Yeah, the the customs declarations, everything else will be will be the same, no matter where you're selling to. So you need to that gives you an opportunity to review: Are you concentrating on the best markets for your business? Uh, it may not be. Um, new free trade agreements will be on UK terms, perhaps. So, for example, the UK Japan agreement includes provisions for for Stilton cheese, which weren't in the EU Japan agreement. So, there's a benefit there for for some people. So, it's important to to start to look at the global market and review all the markets. Where um, look, you know, we'll we'll look at this in more detail on how to review markets and select the best opportunities in our ex export webinar on, on the 4th of December. But it, this is an important area of reviewing your global footprint um, and deciding if the markets that you're, you're aiming at now are the correct ones moving forward or if there are opportunities elsewhere. The same goes for manufacturing supply. Um, given the new Brexit normal, do your manufacturing or distribution locations or your cost centers match where you will sell goods and services? Yeah, a lot of companies now are looking at a localization approach within a global framework. So for example, Honda, um, they have local autonomy, but within a global framework of the, of the overall company. And this is now being taken up by companies like GE and others with multinational companies, of course. Their idea is to reduce the effect of potential protectionist policies like we're seeing in the US now uh, to, on, to, on their business by effectively being local, but by having the backing of a, a multinational um, organization. You may think that doesn't apply to, to your business, but on a smaller scale, would you be benefit, for example, from a fulfillment center or a distribution hub in the, in the EU? Look, will that ease your business, your flow of products and services uh, into, into the EU uh, rather than being concentrated on, on the UK? So it is an area that, that needs to be, to be reviewed. Same with supply, where, where do products come from, which we'll look at in a little bit more detail in a moment. So really what we're saying is in your strategy thoughts, expand your horizons beyond the known and use that to redefine your global strategy from, from a sales, but also from a, a business operation point of view. Uh, look at the opportunities that are out there now. Next is to review your supply chain strategy. Um, this could become uh, you know, a, a big area within Brexit. Uh, it's an ideal opportunity to review that, that strategy and see if it's still the best fit for the post-Brexit -Bre post norm. Uh, do you have a reliance on EU suppliers? So are you reliant on suppliers from the EU? Have you discussed Brexit with your suppliers? Are they ready? You know, do they have the correct EORI number or any licenses or approvals, correct paperwork in place? To, to handle customs declarations, for example, that they'll need to be able to supply you moving forward. Have you reviewed INCO terms within your contracts? Uh, if, if, you're, if they are supplying DDP, are they aware that that will mean they have to pay the VAT to you, for you, for example? What are, what are the, the, um, the INCO terms that are in your contracts? Um, are there any? Make sure it's all covered. Have you reviewed their stock levels that they hold and if they're going to be able to continue to, to supply you if there's delays in, um, in, in supply, for example, through ports, through de de delays in transit times, are lead times going to increase? Duties, pricings, the effect of, of currency, you know, the, all of these factors need to be taken into account when you're looking at your reliance on, on EU suppliers. Um, potential delays at port, we're already seeing at Felix, though, that there are delays, um, delays to Christmas deliveries of goods they're talking about, and we haven't even hit Brexit yet. Now, apparently, there are 11,000 containers stuck at Felix, though, with PPE inside because there's not enough capacity to manage um, the, um, the transit through the port and to, to get them on trucks to, to deliver them out is one of the big problems. 
uh, ships are being sent sent uh, sent away. Uh, one went back to Rotterdam the other day because it couldn't berth at Felixstowe for ten days. So there are, these are potential problems that we were expecting post Brexit, but we're already seeing them now. So we can imagine that post you know post Brexit next year these could multiply even further. So take it into account. You know, is your EU supplier strategy correct based on these potential issues? Um, you know, one of our clients is, is a freight forwarder. Um, we asked them if they, if they thought the new border systems were going to be ready post-Brexit. And basically they laughed and said, no way. <laughs> Even Michael Gove expects two-day delays at uh, Dover and we're building these lorry parks in Kent. Um, but also freight forwarders fear there'll be less foreign trucks arriving in the UK and therefore return trip availability will decline and also delivery capability within the EU UK will, will um, decline. This will lead to higher prices and, and shortages of transport. So every extra cost for every single shipment. Uh, customs declarations is going to increase by 300 million. Um, and that's just on this side of the, of the channel. So there are serious shortages of brokers available to do customs declarations. Um, so, so again, what will be the cost implications of all these new procedures and the potential delays on your EU supplier network. And also consider rules of origin. How much of your product comes from the EU? Um, how much is made up of EU material or components? Will you be able to claim UK origin after Brexit? That may be an issue for you. You may need to reduce that reliance in order to be able to claim UK origin. That depends on the free trade agreements that are um, agreed with the EU, but also with other countries as well. So look at what, they, what effect all of that will have on your business. So it becomes a this strategic choice, given there are so many, so much change, so many factors that will be changing as to whether your reliance on EU suppliers is, is correct. So look at UK alternatives. Are there UK alternatives out there? Um, they may now come into the frame. They may have been too expensive before, or you may have felt they were, but now they may come into the frame. They may now be more cost effective and when you take all of the uh, costs into account. But do check that they're prepared for Brexit as well in case they're, they're affected by their supply chain. Same with the rest of the world. Will your suppliers from the rest of the world be affected by the need for new, you know, by the you need for new free, free trade agreements. Are they in place? Will there be duties? Check what the WTO duty rates might be in case there isn't and how that's going to affect your supplies. If you do decide that you can change, how long does it take you to approve alternatives? How difficult is it for you to approve a new supplier? You may need testing, quality controls, you know, step-by-step -step procedures, packaging differences may come up. And different raw materials, for example, may require formula or process changes within your production. So all of these things need to be taken into account before you can actually swap suppliers. So it's, it takes a bit of time. So it's a strategic decision to look at this and to decide that you're going to, um, to look at alternative suppliers. It may require changes to your ERP system. How long will that take you? And, you know, we just mentioned the rules of origin in new free trade agreements. So does the supply chain fit with those? Take all of these things into account when you're looking at your strategy for your supply chain moving forward. Next, we're going to look at labor flows and talent retention. Yeah, now, as we all know, and the uh, free movement of labor was one of the key um, discussion points within the Leave campaign and one of the key areas that uh, people wanted to see change. But labour is one of your key assets. It's your key asset for your business. And it's particularly true of service businesses, service companies. Uh, EU skilled and low skilled workers are required in this country. There's 70% reduction in net EU migration since the Brexit vote. Uh, Non-EU migration has risen, but at a slower rate. So there's 22,000 staff have left the EU staff have left the NHS alone. And that means there could be shortages of, of people. EU nationalists need to reply, nationals need to apply for the right to remain in the UK. You need to check they have if, if you already have these workers. And we have this new points-based immigration system and you need to register as a sponsor to employ people moving forward and so on. So you need, it's an area that needs to be 
looked at and you need to have a coordinated strategy for your <coughs> labor labor flows and uh, and talent retention so what do you do you need to assess your labor requirements develop your labor strategy for post brexit what skills are you going to need are they available locally or will you need to recruit overseas and how long how will you do that and how long will it take and let's look at contingency planning what if you can't find people do you have the plans in place in, ca in case you can't recruit there are shortages that are being predicted have you taken into account the extra time it may take and have you considered perhaps looking at apprenticeships or in-house training schemes um, to, to overcome that by training local people, for example. There are government schemes available to, to help with this kind of thing. But it's important, again, that we consider all of these elements as part of our uh, strategy on labour. And the same with talent retention. With so many EU nationals returning to their home country, how are you going to retain your, your top talent? It's often overlooked as a key part of, of your strategy. You know, incentives such as salaries, relocation costs, schooling, visa support, and make it easier for, for them, makes it easier for them to stay or for them to, to come to the, to the UK. So again, these are areas that, that need to be considered um, as part of your strategy. Succession planning uh, is, is another key area. You know, young, ambitious people like to see a career path. They need to be encouraged along that um, along that path. And you need to use that to, to help encourage, you know, the, the talent that you need to, to join your company. And also you need to look at um, key staff who may be nearing retirement age. How are you going to replace them? Where is that uh, skill going to come from? Is it within the organization or do you need to look overseas? So do you have a labor and a talent strategy if not really do need one in the post brexit time era because your pool of people is is not shrunk but the the complications of uh, attracting those people have increased and it's an area which definitely needs to to be looked at next is what we call the competition gap so often overlooked area of strategy for for many businesses, many many clients. Uh, when we're, we're talking to them about um, you know inter internationalizing their products, have no idea about their competition. Um, but it's so it is an area that really needs to be uh, to be considered because it can give you so many guidance, so much guidance in how to uh, look at your own business. For example, how is the competition preparing for Brexit? Maybe they're paralyzed by fear. Maybe they're doing nothing, a bit like the rabbits in the headlights syndrome. If so, it's your <clears throat> opportunity to take advantage. So put yourself at the forefront. And if you show leadership in your market now, it will benefit you moving forward. It, it really does work. Um, so analyze the competition. And don't do what we call the hedgehog strategy. That's in challenging times, some companies look for ways to make themselves smaller, roll up like a hedgehog to protect themselves from the outside world. They cut customer service, for example, they reduce marketing just when they need more customers. And this can alienate their customers. And hedgehog strategy is a, is a short term knee jerk reaction that produces long term wounds to the company doing it. So we urge you to avoid the mistake. Of course, costs need to be taken into account when revenues are reduced, but really do review the levels of service that you're able to, um, to provide to, to your customers and make sure those are maintained so you don't lose customer confidence because that can take a long time to recover from, much longer than a, a short-term recession. So and then, look for opportunities to take advantage of the hedgehogs out there so if your competitor has you know cut all his staff and is not visiting people or not not even in contact with their customers um is not a, providing customer service then use that to your advantage by saying well look no we're not doing that we're taking care of our customers and so on so you can really uh, increase your business in a time of challenge um have any of your eu competitors left the uk there have been some companies which have left the uk because they feel it's going to be too difficult post brexit some eu companies so that's it leaves a gap which potentially you can fill 
So maybe you can buy their customer list or you can take the direct approach and, uh, and advertise to, to their customers or even look at acquiring the business that they've left behind. You may get it for a pound, you never know. Um, <clears throat> and they're going to look at, will there be less or will there be more competition? You know, exchange rates, duties, customs arrangements, for example, could all make EU suppliers less attractive in the UK. That will help to, you know, UK consumers may turn to UK brands, which may mean um, that you can be, have a bigger share of the UK market. And again, we looked at earlier about, you know, whether it's an area to concentrate on, take advantage of that potential uh, change in market dynamics and look at increasing your, your business. Be aware of the competition that will help you to do that. But as a reverse, that may mean there'll be more competition in the EU. You know, UK companies may become less competitive because of the, the same reasons. Um, so review all the different scenarios, plan your strategy to counter competition, but also to take advantage of their failings and differentiate your business from that. These are all key areas for, for strategy, we believe, moving forward. Next, innovation. Now, you, you'll probably be wondering why there's a picture of a John Deere tractor there. That'll all become clear in a, in a little while. It's not there for because I like tractors. Um, but what Brexit is going to create challenges. We know that it's going to create new challenges. Um, there'll be reduced tradition, reduction in potentially in our traditional markets in the EU. And how can we counter this? You know, we can look at new opportunities, new customers. Um, and how to, to, to get into those new markets. And perhaps one of the ways is through innovation. New regions may have different demands on your products or services. For example, they may need different features, different capabilities, different designs, different ways of working with, with services. Each area is, has slightly different norms and what they're used to may be different to what you are. And this may require you to, to innovate your, you know, within your products or services to, to be able to, to meet those requirements in those markets. There may be new approvals and standards. Uh, for, you know, there may be different labeling or packaging, for example. You know, it may be that one market is used to handling a product in bulk bags compared to 20 kilogram bags, or they may, their norm may be not 20 kilograms, but 15 kilogram bags because of health and safety laws. They may have paper versus plastic you'll have to change. You need to innovate your, yourselves. The market won't change for you necessarily. So look at all of these things. You know, you require an innovation strategy in, able to, in order to, um, to be able to, to expand in some, to some of the countries that we talked about with the, with the global footprint. You need to take it into account. So review your capability for innovation internally and externally can you do you have enough internal capability can you can you use external support for innovation in some of these areas that you may need to your answer to that in your strategy on innovation may well influence your sales and marketing strategy so it is important because you know it'll de de determine which countries you can go to and how fast you can go to them you may have to delay some countries because you need to innovate to be able to um, be competitive in those markets. So, so it's, a, it's a coordinated strategy with other areas of the business as well. Um, so, it, but there is an innovation, you know, on an opportunity for brought about by Brexit. You know, develop your products to help solve customers' Brexit challenges. Is there something you can do um, that will make your product more attractive because of Brexit to, to those customers. Look for gaps in the marketplace. Um, that's, that's a key area that we, that we believe companies should be looking for. You know, away from, from Brexit, but related is technology change, accelerated technology change. There's been rapid growth of data and digital technologies um, over, the, over recent years. And this can really be used to, to enhance your business. And that's the reason the John Deere um, picture is there. They're farm machinery producer, tractors and so on, which you would think is a fairly traditional industry. You sell a tractor and, and off you go. But now they've branched out. So a big part of their business now is to provide data 
to provide digital services to their clients. So, for example, the farmer can now see where all his machinery is through, through an app or through, through his computer sitting in his office. He can see how it's performing, the spread rates and the outputs, the yields. It can also link into the weather, the soil types, and it can maximize the results for each, for each area of the business. So the farmer is coming to rely on John Deere, not only for his machinery, but for his information about his business and how to make his business as efficient as possible. And what effect does that have? It reduces the threat of competition. That farmer is going to keep buying John Deere. He's not going to buy Massey Ferguson, even if they're cheaper, because he wants to keep his data and his digital services. So look at how you can add value to your products um, through technology. We have a client at the moment we're working with a company called RetroTech that measures road markings, the outputs of road markings. But the big part of the way they differentiate themselves is with the data, the way they present data and what the data can do and the information it can provide to highways authorities. So consider how innovation of this type could benefit your customers. What data do they need? What information do they use? What would benefit them? Process automation is also another big area. It's a huge topic and potential for businesses due to leaps in technology, robotics, AI, and so on. So review the potential to automate processes and roles within your business, particularly in light of you know, um, labor becoming scarce, as we discussed early, earlier, and therefore becoming more expensive. But we're not just talking about manufacturing or agriculture. There's also opportunities across business functions such as HR, sales, marketing and finance. For example, sales automation software it takes away the menial repetitive tasks and makes them more efficient and helps reduce costs and also improve efficiency. So do you have an, auto, an innovation strategy within your business? It can affect so many things. It can affect your sales and marketing. You know, every business needs to be innovating or looking at the next developments that are going to keep them ahead of the competition. Now, value proposition. Now, what value do you bring to your customers? You may say, well, it's value proposition a strategic choice. Well, yes, in, in, in our opinion, it is. Many people just think of it as just the way of selling your product. But in fact, it should be the fundamental of your business. How do you want to be perceived? How will you operate cost-based or value-driven? Do you create value for your customers and money will flow? Uh, see if the value, see the value in your suppliers and not just the price. You know, you, you, whether they supply you on time and not there's not just 10p cheaper, for example. So the Brexit effect of that is that your value proposition may have, may have shifted due to Brexit challenges. For example, customers in France may be looking for local suppliers due to red tape duties and delays and so on. So you, your value proposition to them, to attract them, needs to include making buying from you easy, just the same as before Brexit. Create value around your product over and above the pure cost um, of, the, of the product it, itself. So look, and then again, in, in new markets, um, other regions of the world may need or require a different value proposition. You know, what is the market looking for or what is it lacking? How do you tap into that and how do you create this value in, in your product in the perception of the customer that they want to buy your product over someone else's and will pay that extra to, to get the product if that's the case? And use, you look at technology, use technology as we've just seen to increase um, the value of your products, um, as we saw in the innovation section. And use data and digital services advances to add value for your customers. So build value, that helps you gain customers. Build value will increase your returns. Currency is a, a, another strategic decision now because um, Currency fluctuations are increasing. They're getting bigger and faster. Um, uncertainty leads to nervousness in the market because of Brexit and all of these different areas we've looked at, COVID. You know, sterling rose 1.7% versus the euro in 24 hours last week and 2.4% against the yen. When COVID hit in March, it's 7.7% versus the euro within two weeks. 
So these can have profound effects on the competitiveness of your business. So minimize the change. Look at hedging. You can look at um, you know other financial um, project uh, programs as well. It's hedging is no longer a black art. There are specialist companies out there to support you. We can provide details if you would like some. But you do know, look at the the direct and the indirects of currency, the value change. The indirects can be the effects can be you know profound really. Prices of our sales and purchases will increase or decrease depending on the currency fluctuation. So we've got a loss of competitiveness, increased costs, pricing instability. Depending if we're pricing in pounds, then our customers are buying in pounds. Their price in, in euros will be changing all the time. Or our margin will be changing if we're keeping our prices in one level in euros, for example. So it will also affect you know, the value of salaries that you're offering to foreign workers who want to send money home. So again, it's an, another area that needs to, to be considered in your uh, labor strategy. Um, so you need a strategy to mitigate the risk. And that's a combination of you know, financial instruments that we've been talking about, like hedging, but also minimizing the risk in the first place by reviewing the supply chain, uh, distribution methods, pricing structures and terms that we've, that we've covered earlier on. Marketing and communications, well, you know, does your marketing message need adjusting to emphasize that you're ready um, to help clients and you're to overcome Brexit hurdles? Um, portray this level of confidence that you're ready, convey to the market you're ready and you're dealing with, with and then dealing with you post-Brexit will be the same as before. Communicate this with suppliers, with workers and with, with stakeholders as well. You know, it's important to get that message out there that you're here, we've looked at it, we know what we're doing, we're, we're ready and we're prepared. Same with your uh, product and service marketing message. And that may need to change in the post-Brexit world. You may need to change that message based on your new value proposition, for example. Or you may want to emphasize a made in Britain or proud to be EU, to include EU components, committed to the EU, whatever it might be, whatever message you feel is, 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 is going to be best moving forward that the market is, is demanding, then you, you, there is a, undoubtedly there's going to be a change in the marketing message that you need to, to put out there. Same goes with the brand positioning. It may need adjusting um, after exit, exiting the EU, EU, and it may not be the same in all countries if you're going to new countries. So again, need to be reviewed. It's a strategic review of the marketing and communications of, of your business. And finally, is leadership and relationships. And this is a key strategy decision for your business post-Brexit. You know, in an uncertain world, leadership becomes critical. You know, how you lead your organization and build relationships internally and externally will be crucial post-Brexit. It requires, therefore, deep consideration and strategic planning. The message you convey will affect the performance of your business. You know, Brexit has created uncertainty and a feeling of impending doom for some. And you need to convey calm. You need to convey a positive outlook to, to everyone communicate the preparations that, be, that you've carried out and that you are ready for the challenge ahead. And this needs to be done internally and externally. Communicate the opportunities you see post-Brexit. Be positive as a leader, be positive. Don't dwell on the past. Brexit's happened, move forward. Move your organization forward. So you can look at building stronger, more transparent and more responsive relationships internally and externally post-Brexit. And that's with customers, that's suppliers, with workers, with shareholders, directors, the media, with all stakeholders. Uh, you can see from the picture there, the area, so guidance, people are looking for guidance from you as a leader, that things are going to be all right, that we're you know, going in the right direction. You know, there's a solution there. Involve people in, in generating that solution and in, 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 the, in the vision for the business and teamwork. You know, you, as we mentioned earlier, there will be different perspectives from different people within your organization. Take those into account in order to find the right direction for your business. So be open, be transparent with people, and, and but at the same time, convey um, what your strategy is going to be. Communicate with people. And, and make sure everyone's aware of what the end goal is going to be so that it's, it's very clear. Communication is key and the message is critical. 
be positive. So the key strategic decision for your business post Brexit is um, on the leadership that you that you give. So create an organisation that's motivated to achieve a common goal. So in summary, um, as from the 1st of January next year, we're out of the EU. There may or may or not be a deal, but whatever, there will also there'll be profound changes. A lot of the things we've discussed will, won't change whether there's a free trade agreement or not. You need to plan for Brexit, embrace change in the new skills, and it's time for a complete strategic review. You know, take, hit that pause button, step back and have a think about it, review each area of your business. Are your current milestones and KPIs still valid? Uh, if you take away one thing from this, this webinar, leadership in the communication strategy is critical moving forward, as is creating this culture of always on change because of the infinite number of challenges that your business will face long after Brexit is finished and COVID-19 has gone away. There's always going to be new challenges and we need to be ready for them with always on change culture within our business. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that was uh, informative and uh, we're happy to look at any questions. Thanks, Mike. Lots of info there as always. You have got a couple of questions on the side there. You don't take two minutes to have a look. Okay, so yeah, the first one from Liz. Um, isn't a Yori number required by service organisations? The UK says it's for moving goods. No, it is for, for moving goods. You don't need it for, for services. Um, from Hazel, what is TURN? Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to there, so we'll, I, I'll have a, I'll check up on that and, and come back to you. Um, Brian Miller, does DDP and co turns relieve our EU customer of all duties and paperwork at their end? Yes, it does. Uh, it also means you incur the VAT um, if you do it that way. And um, so you, if you want to reclaim that VAT, you would need to have a local VAT number within the country that you're supplying. Uh, and to do that, uh, you would also need um, a um, perhaps a fiscal representative in the country in order to set up that VAT number. And what is DUCR? So again, quite not quite sure, Hazel, what you're referring to there. So again, I will look at that. Okay. Does anybody want to come off their microphones and ask any questions? or make any comments you must be all uh, covered in your uh, session then sorry I've, I, it, it's hazel um i yes it's to do with peach it's to do with um we we sell well we purchase plants in from holland and france and places like that and on the peach website it's asking us for the turn and the um it says that the d UCR contains the turn and is required for clearance of import declarations through the HMRC chief um, system. Uh, the turn is supposed to be a, um, a 12 digit number. If your VAT, uh, if your company's VAT registered, then the turn will comprise of the VAT registration number plus a three digit suffix um, defi as defined by your company. That's what it says. Um, to do with the turn, just um, to give you some more information. Okay, right, yeah, so it's very, very specific there. Okay, um, yeah, so I know what you're referring to now. I will look that up for you and I'll come back okay. to you with, uh, with some advice on that. Okay, that would be brilliant. Anyone else have any questions? No, I think we're good there, Mike. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I hope it was useful for everyone. Oh, hang on. I just had something come in. Again, would love more specifics on services. Yes, Liz, I think you asked that same question for the last webinar, didn't you, about uh, um, more, yes, a more specific webinar about services themselves rather than goods. So, yes, I think um, it is slightly different, obviously. Okay. No, that looks good. Okay, thanks, Mike, for giving up your time again this morning. Uh, we'll be seeing you. Uh, when is the next one? I can't remember now. Got my list next there. Wednesday, I think it is. Oh, next Wednesday, yeah. Fabulous. So, thanks again for that. Thanks, everybody, for turning up this morning.
don't forget to look out for your um, AG3 forms coming through. Can you get those signed in straight back to me as soon as possible? And obviously the survey as well. So uh, thanks to everyone again and have a good day.